Hey everybody, welcome back to another Nature's Always Right episode. Today we're getting into how to build your own raised beds. Whether you're going to do a similar design to what I did, or just do straight wood, or cement blocks, or whatever you want to do, there's going to be lots of tips in this video to help you regardless of what type of raised bed you're using. We're gonna get into um, some planting tips, amendment tips, uh, how to fill this up with soil, some of the specific things that I'm doing for these raised beds because they're so high, uh, to make it more inexpensive to fill these up, uh, to make them more moisture absorbing, and to add long-term food sources for microbes and your plants. And of course, we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of how to build these exact boxes that I built and building these boxes using the metal saved me about $600 and got me um, another six to eight inches in height for my beds as well, opposed to using just wood, because many of you may know, wood prices are out of control right now in the US. This video is sponsored by Hoselink. Huge thank you to Hoselink. They sent me out one of their hose reels. I've seen tons of different YouTubers and Instagram gardener people using these, so I've been curious to try it and I, love this thing. I put this in the center of my garden so that it will reach anywhere around this area. It's 82 feet long and it will actually reach all the way to my blueberries, which I was very excited about. So be sure to stay till the end. I'm going to give Nature's Always Right viewers a special discount code. Thank you to Hoselink for doing that for us. And I'll show you how this thing works and how to install it and all that good stuff. So first, let's just get into why did I set up raised beds in the first place versus in-ground beds, which I have right in front of me. So when I show these beds off on Instagram, uh, be sure to follow me there if you're not already so you can see all my updates and what I'm currently working on. Uh, they asked me, Stephen, why are you doing raised beds versus in-ground beds? And the easy answer to that is they're easy to work on, basically no weeds, you don't have to bend over as much. And we just wanted, you know, this is right in front of our house, so we want it to look very nice. And we have a property that we own now and it makes more sense to invest in infrastructure and some nicer things now. So some of the negatives to raised beds you might want to consider if you're deciding between the two, of course they are expensive in comparison to just doing in the ground. This is not ideal if you're trying to grow an enormous quantity of food or if you want to be a farmer. Raised beds are not what you should be doing, it doesn't make sense. Um, for a home garden, for a homestead, for all those um, smaller quantities of food, this is the way to go, I think. It just makes things so much easier. But I also, I can't run a direct seeder in here. So radishes, beets, carrots, uh, salad mixes, anything like that, I would have to seed it by hand, which is way more work. I can use my Earthway seeder out there. So my strategy for these raised beds, since I don't have to bend over as much, these are for things that I will be replacing more often. Um, or something that is easier to manage within a box. For instance, if you wanted to grow watermelon or winter squash, something that's gonna vine out and grow crazy, well, what you can do in a raised bed is plant it at the corners. And even these zucchinis, as they grow longer, you can push them up and out of the bed, and which will actually create more growing space that you could plant lettuce or something uh, low growing. So anything that vines out, if you're gonna put that in a raised bed, put it in the corner of your bed so it can go up and out and not take up the entire grow space of your bed. That's what's so great about in-ground beds is that I can do anything that vines out there, I can use my direct seeder. So having the combination of both gives me the best of both worlds. So the materials for my beds are uh, yellow pine wood, Galvanized roofing tin. Many people have asked me, Stephen, is, there, is it dangerous to use a zinc coated galvanized metal? No, it's not at all. Don't worry about that. The only danger to the zinc coating is if you were to like burn this metal, that gas would be toxic. So this bottom board here is a pressure treated board. I use all pressure treated wood for anything that was touching the ground. Some people may feel comfortable to use pressure treated wood for all of their boards. I'm personally not. I want to stay away from any and all chemicals to the best of my ability. Now they do use a much safer chemical than the creosote arsenic that they used to use many decades ago. I think it's a, now it's a copper, um, like antifungal type of treatment now to help resist rot. So you just have to decide that on your own. Now natural wood alternatives, 
cedar or redwood are the top types of wood that are naturally rot resistant. Now, because wood's so expensive, I, I just didn't want to go that route. Another great way to get cedar, they do sell it in, I think, six inch uh, wide boards. So if you want to do a cheaper, smaller raised bed that's only six inches tall, you can easily do that with cedar using those smaller boards and it will be cheaper. So that's a great another option for you. So the other big question is, why did I build these so tall? These are about uh, two and a half feet tall. Well, after cutting down a ton of trees on my land, I had tons of logs left over. So I, what I wanted to do is create a hugel culture bed type setup. So what we did is we buried logs at the bottom, layering the biggest logs first going up. We covered those logs with wood chips left over from the stump grinding that we did. So this is all free material so far. We filled it up to about right there. Now, all that carbon, the logs and the wood chips are gonna absorb moisture and they're also adding bulk to our bed. This is now area that's taken up by free wood um, that we don't have to add in compost. I was able to add in six to seven wheelbarrows of, of my mushroom compost to the top here that's basically all that's in each of these beds. That saved me an immense amount of money on compost. Now all that carbon is gonna break down over time, adding nutrients to the soil, extreme moisture absorbing. When we get our huge rain events here in Tennessee, all that moisture is gonna be absorbed and locked in down in that wood layer. So these roots, if they run out of moisture in the compost layer, they can dive down to the carbon layer. They're gonna be able to get moisture there. Uh, so it's going to really lower the amount of watering that I'll need to do. And raised beds are notorious for drying out uh, a bit quicker. So one other possible negative of these beds, metal, right, is going to heat up in the sunlight. So this will help you in the winter to warm up soil. In the summer, it could cause some drying out of your beds. I have not really noticed any of that, honestly. And when I put my hand on the other side of the metal, it is warm and some of the soil and the soil touching that metal is warm, but very quickly, right after that, the soil's not warm anymore. So in my opinion, it's not gonna really uh, bother things too much. Roots, I don't envision roots going up against this. That won't happen, but they can stay an inch back and be fine. That's been my observation of building these metal type raised beds. You know, I've done wood raised beds. If wood was cheaper, I just would have used wood and I wouldn't have done this. So when it came to the nutrition for these beds, we had our logs, our wood chips, our six wheelbarrows of the mushroom compost, and then I layered on top about one to two inches of the super compost that I made in a past video, which you can go watch about how I created that, which with all natural inputs. The base is a rabbit manure and straw combination. Uh, this has biochar in it, other natural farming inputs, and I layered that on top so that when it rains, the high amounts of nutrients are gonna infiltrate down into the soil and get locked into the soil and then the carbon layers down below. It's another great thing about having all that carbon below. Um, that's gonna soak up nitrogen. You know, when it rains um, or whenever you put out fresh compost, some of those nutrients will be released by the compost and the water and go down into the lower layers. And you've probably seen that if you've ever watered and overwatered a pot and you see the brown water running away, that is some of the nutrients are running away. Now for minerals, what I added was azomite and kelp meal, and I just mixed that in with a rake. And then I finished by putting this on top. Um, and that's all I did for my nutrition for these plants, and they're growing really great. Now the first year that you start a garden or a raised bed, don't expect the same results that you'll get years down the line. Every year, if you're using no-till um, living soil principles, your soil will get better every year, your plants will be healthier every year, more nutrient dense every year. Um, if you use the techniques that I teach on this channel and other regenerative farmers around the world teach. So now I wanna share some of the mistakes I made to help you build better and stronger boxes. So you may see that this board is bowing out intensely. This is the worst one. This happened for many reasons. This board is warped. Some of the boards that I got from the mill were kind of twisted and messed up. So that's one benefit to going to Home Depot or Lowe's. You can pick each one of your boards to make sure that they're perfect. So it didn't like fit together perfectly. The other issue is when leveling this bed, I should, because the slope's going this way, I should slightly tilt it back up a little bit. 
so that the weight's going that way a bit more. So it's putting pressure here. So here are a couple ways that you could fix this or prevent this. One, simple, take a two by four, span it across, bolt it in, it's gonna hold it together. Now the other thing that the Birdies raised beds, this, let's say an Australian brand of raised beds, probably the best in the, in the world, honestly. And they, on their metal raised beds, they use a metal, like an all thread, like one of those long pieces of, of metal, and it ties in on both sides, you know, throw some wing nuts on, something like that with some washers, that would hold it together. And that made me maybe another good option. I'm gonna let this play out and I'm gonna see what happens to my beds and fix them if need be, because I wanna see, you know, what it ends up happening. Something I overlooked a little bit. I was trying to save as much money as possible on wood and supplies. Um, I think this, for all my supplies, uh, I think it cost me $1,200. And I, I have some leftover wood and tin that I'm gonna use for a chicken coop, but um, $1,200 for all that stuff. So it was quite pricey and I was trying, as always, I'm trying to, you know, find the best deal, do things as efficiently and as easily as possible to show you guys. But when I do that sometimes, it causes some problems because I should have built this a bit beefier. So those are just some things for you to think of and watch out for when you build this. You know, maybe I put some more support pieces here on the sides. Um, there's a few ways you could go about reinforcing this to make sure that this does not occur. Putting, putting in corner pieces as well that I mentioned earlier. Okay, you guys, so let's check out the best hose reel on the market. This thing is gonna save me a lot of headaches. You know, I've used hoses on gardens over the last, you know, 10 years, and I've always dreamt of a hose reel that worked really well. And I think that this is probably the best option out there. So what this is, it's an 82 foot hose reel. They give you this base plate that's crazy strong. I even stood on it because I was pretty impressed by it. Now, a lot of people will install these on posts in their garden. I decided, hey, I'm, why don't I just throw this on the back of a bed? So I took a nice big chunk of wood, put that in, put the base plate on, and I was good to go. Now, the hose here connects back to my house. In the future, I'm gonna set up a, a permanent connection with polyline to the faucet going under the landscape fabric to here, and then it'll just be, like, be seamless. From there, it swivels, so wherever you're going in the garden, it follows you. Now, for watering this part of the garden, I just pull it out, and they have this great little ball on here that helps you pull it. And I'm even pulling this at an angle on this thing. It's not pulling straight out, and it still works great. I've also, uh, I'll reel it back in from this position, too. So what's so great about this thing is it locks open. So now I can go around, water what I need to water, and when I'm done, I just pull back on the hose. That clicks, and now it retracts. You know, obviously I haven't used it very long, but it's very well built. The pulley system and whatever, you know, works within the reel is very well engineered. Um, I tried pulling this thing in and out from different angles, as you saw, I was pulling it against this side. You know, it's probably better if you let it reel in straight on, but it's able to do it either way. I went full out the whole 82 feet and let it reel back in, and it still had enough power to be able to do that. It has lead-free fittings everywhere. So in addition to giving you everything you need to install it, they also give you this fantastic multi-sprayer that is excellent quality, that's gonna last a very long time, I can tell. It's better than anything else I've gotten online before. And they also have this special adapter. Oops, oh, gotta turn it off. They have this special adapter system, which I thought was pretty innovative. And they give you a bunch of these other adapters because there's other accessories and things that you can get for your hose link. And it just snaps together like that. But it's, let's say you had um, their wand attachment, you just have these quick connects, boom and now I'm watering again. So very cool, very innovative, very well engineered. Um, so go check out Hoselink. Here is the discount code for you guys. And thank you Hoselink for sponsoring the video and just creating wonderful, wonderful products. So to build these boxes, you're really only gonna need a drill and some screws. And that's basically about it. 
Um, an optional tool that I chose to use was, this is called a Craig Jig. And this just basically allows you to drill perfect pilot holes to create a really clean look. This is often used in cabinetry making. Um, it's about 90 or 100 bucks for the kit and they give you the drill you need, a clamp, and all these other accessories. Um, they sell these special screws for the Craig Jig, but you do not need to use those. I use straight up just three inch construction screws. Um, you just wanna be careful to not over penetrate the wood. So that's why you can't see the screw holes here. And basically what this did is it saved me having to toenail into this board to attach it. Toenailing is when you would take a, a drill, pilot hole in at a 45 degree angle, and then drill your screw in this side and this side, this side and that side. Okay, that just will be a bunch more work. You're gonna be doing this many, many times if you do a bunch of boxes. So uh, this makes this a little bit more streamlined and cleaner. And I wanna use this on other projects. So that's why I purchased this, but that's a little more info on how to do the centerpiece. So now I'm gonna show you how to construct one of these 12 by three foot raised beds. For the cut list for each bed, you're gonna need two pressure treated two by four by 12 foots, two treated two by four by 36. If you'd like detailed step-by-step -step instructions on how to build these raised garden boxes, including cut lists to make your work more efficient, check the video's description below for the link to go download it. It will be available soon. So I'll use a chop saw to cut all of my pieces out. Be sure to double check your measurements so that this will fit together as perfectly as possible. So one tip when you're making your cuts, where you put your mark, if you were to cut right on top of that mark, it would end up a bit short. So cut slightly to the right of that to get it perfect. The next step is to use the Craig jig to drill out four holes where our screws are gonna go. If you are not using a Craig jig, this would be a great time to drill your toenailed pilot holes, or you can wait until you're assembling it. When using the Craig jig, be sure to squeeze the trigger so that it becomes super tight and the drill goes in smoothly right at the spot where you need it. So we are using two by fours and the actual measurement of a two by four is 1.5 by 3.5 inches. Because we have a 1.5 inch thickness, according to the Craig guide, you'll need a two and a half inch screw. Now you do not need to use the expensive Craig screws. I used two and a half inch construction screws. Be sure to set your Craig collar to the correct length, which is 1.5 inches so you drill to the correct depth. If you are toenailing, I recommend using a three inch construction screw. And you'll need three inch screws for the rest of the project drilling together all the pieces. Okay, so I've taken all the pieces that we made and drilled. This is everything that you need for one bed. Uh, I've laid it out to make it really easy for me to drill together. The only thing I really need to do at this point is find the center point so that I can place this board in the correct location. And then lining up the galvanized metal to fit really well. Um, and other than that, it's just drilling it together. Obviously drilling on the ground is not the most ergonomic, but I don't really have a better place to do it right now. And actually doing it on the ground makes it easier to uh, make the boards fit nicely together because some boards are slightly warped they, or they don't sit perfect. You can put pressure on the wood, which makes it sit flat. And then it's much easier to get the wood to line up really nicely and build a very straight box. Once you've constructed your two side pieces, it's now time to put on the galvanized roofing panel. Now these beds were built according to the size of this roofing panel actually, which is 12 foot long by 26 inches tall. Now I did this to make it easier to install the roofing panel. The 12 foot panels that go on the long sides don't need any cuts. It's only on the left and right sides that will need to be cut to the three foot length. So at the time of purchase, these 12 foot sections cost 21.55 each. 
and I just checked Home Depot, prices have gone up further and I can't even find these exact panels. So be sure to check Lowe's or your other local hardware stores. The Lowe's ones unfortunately are 2.16 inches tall. And if that's the case that you can only find that, you will need to adjust those 10 vertical pieces um, by half a foot approximately. The roofing tin is held in place by one inch roofing screws. They're zinc coated so they will not rust. Now you can of course buy cheaper screws if you like. I wanted to buy the nice ones. So once you've constructed all four pieces, you just need to put them together using three inch construction screws. So if you're doing this by yourself, it makes it easier if you can lean it up against a wall and kind of use your legs and hands to brace it all together and make sure that as you screw it together, things are lining up really nicely so that it looks good. Once constructed, even these 12 foot long boxes are not that heavy to move if you use a dolly. On one end, a person holds the box. On the other end, you put the dolly and you can roll it wherever you want. How did I start this, get the correct angle in the beginning so that I could lay these out all in parallel um, and make it look nice when you're looking out from the house and all of that? Well, the first thing that my wife and I did was just walk around, look at the space, get a feel for it. Uh, we started just um, looking at the house and where we might want to have the beds line up with. Maybe we have it line up with the side of the house to make it look like it's all in line. We start, we put out some flags on the ground to mark out where potential beds could be. Highly recommend doing that so you can get some sort of visual. The final thing we did is I just built two of those boxes. We put them out here, put them where we thought we wanted them and then got the feel for that, looked at it from different angles, and then said, yeah, this looks good, and let's continue with that. Um, so what I did is I tried to copy the angle of the house, um, and it's, which is nice because the angle of the house is perpendicular to the slopes. Water coming down will get captured. I'll, I'll eventually dig a swale in front um, and do some other water management techniques around here, putting in mulch and all that. So the one, tricky part which I eventually kind of just did it by eye was trying to make these beds at the same angle as the house. I took a, a piece of string line, you could use chalk line, uh, and just stretch that out in parallel with the line of the house I wanted to copy um, and then put a flag here. I did it at another one, put a flag, and that gave me a rough estimate of where I wanted to be but honestly it was easier just to put the two beds out here, look at it from all these different angles to make sure it looked good and then you know finally said okay this is where we want it so the first bed that you put in if you're in a similar situation that's going to be the corner piece everything will be based upon that so getting that one in the right angle set up is really important because off of that one i'm just taking measurements to make sure it's in parallel just uh, like i'm about to show you okay guys so now it's time to show you how to place this in the ground now, if you're on a flat slope or concrete or some rocks or wood chips, a flat area, you're not going to have to do all this extra work that I'm doing, but here's some tips on what I did to deal with the slope, and hopefully that will help you. And of course, I saved the worst box to show you guys, to show you how I can overcome this. So the first thing I need to do is make sure that these two beds are parallel going this way. The easiest way to do that is to just measure this edge to this edge. So I want the pathway to be four foot in distance. So I just need to move this bed out to four feet on this side and that side, and then they'll be parallel. Okay, so now I just wanna visually check that this is actually in line. It's not too far left or right of the other bed and that the angle looks correct. And you can even go look from either a higher up distance or a further away distance and to make sure everything looks really nice. The next step after getting everything in line exactly how you want it is to start digging the trench that is gonna help to balance this out. Okay, so for the next part of the process, you are going to need a level and then just take a look at it by eye. You're gonna be able to tell which side is way higher than the other. If it's just, you know, barely off, then, you know, get the level in there so you can really see what you need to start doing. I can tell that this side is way higher you also might notice that this is offset a little bit from that bed. Well, that's because when I dig in here, the bed's gonna shift over to go in that little trench and then it will line up with that bed. So I started using a little trenching shovel, four inch trenching shuffle to try to dig these. 
and there's lots of rocks and clay, so it's pretty hard. This has been my most valuable tool, the pickaxe. So I'm gonna dig this first one out, and then I'll show you what I do to get the outsides and the other edge so that um, when you put it in the trench, it all lines up and, and it works. Okay, so I've dug out what I think the depth of the trench will approximately need to be. Before I can test it though, I need to dig this angle and going this way. Right now I'm lined up with this bed right here. So I wanna make sure my trench is gonna be right there. And I'm gonna to have to push this forward a little bit. So I just took my shovel and kind of marked the spot, but I also dug this first trench to roughly the spot it needs to be where I'm gonna put the next trench. So I'm just gonna push it straight forward a few inches so that I can get my pickaxe in there. So using these more broad tools like the shovel and the pickaxe is allowing me to have some wiggle room in there. There's four inches of play that I can move back and forth to get it really perfectly aligned, but you still need to make sure that it's close. So I know that this corner needs to be sunk down the lowest. That corner doesn't really need to go down at all. So as I'm digging towards this corner, I'm digging less and less deep. So this next side is gonna be a little bit trickier because I'm gonna, I need to push it this way a little bit so that I can make the trench in the right position. I will try to line it up with the other trench, but to really make sure I'm gonna measure again to the other bed on both sides to make sure I'm still on that parallel line that I want. That measurement that I take from this other bed, it's gonna be more like 46 inches and not 48, something around that. As long as the measurement on each side is the same, we will be on that same parallel line. And then the final thing I'm gonna to need to do is put a block on that corner. And as I've gotten down deeper into the yard here where it's steeper, I've noticed that that's pretty much the only way that I can get it perfectly balanced. Cool, so that's perfectly level with this one two by four piece. And then the other thing that I'll do is just make sure that there is dirt uh, underneath this. So that will also help to support the structure over time. Now I'm just gonna check the level of everything one last time and we should be good to go. All right, everybody. So these are my raised beds. Thank you so much for watching. On a future video, I will show you how I built my in-ground beds and that whole process, which is a bit different. Thank you to Hoselink for sponsoring